Good afternoon, folks. My name is Dilip. I work for Cisco Systems. In today's session, we are going to cover how is Neutron Extension Framework is designed, and uh, we'll go into the details of how to add additional extensions using this framework. And also, we will cover few use cases in terms of like uh, some of the customer requirements, how we met using these extensions. Uh, with that introduction, I will hand over to Abhishek. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Abhishek Raut. I'm from Cisco Systems as well. Uh, Dilip has given you the agenda now. And, uh, let's just deep, like, dive into it. Uh, I believe most of you guys uh, who are here probably know about Neutron. I'm just going to touch upon you know, what Neutron is. Uh, it's a networking service for OpenStack. Um, which provides uh, uniform northbound APIs, uh, which can be consumed by uh, different clients like uh, Horizon, the dashboard, or you can write your own CLIs, uh, or you can have your own uh, orchestration tools, uh, scripts to manipulate these uh, resources that are um, exposed by Neutron. Um, Neutron is a pluggable architecture. Uh, you can have uh, plugins, uh, different vendors can have their own plugins. Uh, which can enable uh, the physical as well as, as well as virtual switches and networking devices. Um, so uh, with this, uh, I'd like to go into that, uh, the core resources that Neutron provides. Um, the three basic core resources, uh, the network, the subnet, and the port. Um, a network is nothing but a, um, a virtual layer two domain. Uh, it's, it can be realized in, with various technologies like VLAN, VXLAN, or it could be a flat network. Um, each of these networks have a, have a pool of IP addresses, uh, which are called the subnets. Uh, they are uh, a contiguous block of IP addresses wherein you know, uh, uh, each of those IP addresses can be assigned to ports. Um, and these, these ports are nothing but the switch ports that we have. Uh, uh, logical switch ports, and they they can be tied to a VM. Uh, it can be tied to a DHCP service or L3 L3 agents, uh, and they carry the MAC address and the IP address. Uh, uh. So, uh, with uh, having said that, uh, so these were the three uh, when we started Neutron. These were the three uh, resources that was enough to get the basic uh, stuff going on, but. Uh, uh, we wanted to make sure that Neutron is uh, extensible. Uh, you know, we can add more features to Neutron, and that's why um, um, we uh, made the architecture such that it's extensible, um, and um, so that you can add new services, uh, you can solve complex problems, uh, and uh, also various vendors they have their own capabilities. Uh, now, these vendors can expose their capabilities and integrate into Neutron uh, via extensions. So that doesn't break your uh, original API. And, uh, and it's not necessary that every plugin has to implement all the extensions that are, are, that are available. So, um, so, so that's why extensions are very uh, useful. Um, and uh, it helps in evolving the Neutron API. So we started off with three resources. Uh, but slowly, gradually, we started adding more services, more features. Uh, and today, if you look at Neutron, it has over 25 uh, core common extensions. And uh, there are many other extensions which are vendor specific. Uh, so uh, that also leads to uh, the next phase of Neutron, which would be, I think, probably we will call it V3 or so. That's the versioning of Neutron, wherein uh, with the extension framework that we provided, we provided a breeding ground for these uh, new co common core extensions to evolve. And once they have become stabilized, uh, we will absorb them into the core Neutron API. So there's going to be a design talk around that uh, versioning. And um, so for uh, some of examples, like uh, the common extensions are security groups, quotas. Uh, that's very vital for uh, deployment. So. Uh, so extension is a way to you know, pro make that happen. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, based on how, what the intent of that extension is, uh, it could be broadly classified into a uh, vendor-specific extension or a common extension. A common extension is something that is 
common throughout for, for all the, it will solve a common use case, while a vendor specific extension is something that will help you uh, enable your own uh, vendor specific uh, capabilities uh, into Neutron. And, um, and then there are two types of extensions, uh, a resource extension and an attribute extension. So uh, Neutron has three core resources, but you might want to do something which you know is not uh, which cannot be achieved with these uh, three resources. So you could introduce a brand new resource, and what are the different attributes that this brand new resource would uh, would define? So if you want to do that, you'll be doing the resource extension. But if you want to use the existing core resource, like the network subnet report, and you think that the attribute because it has limited set of attributes. Uh, but perhaps uh, there's something that you would want to add into that uh, core resource. Uh, so, so you will use the attribute extension and enhance the uh, core resource. So, so now we'll get a little technical uh, um, uh, as to how to write these extensions. Um, so they, these are the basic steps that uh, you, would, uh, you would do in order to uh, expose your extensions via Neutron. Uh, you'll need to add a resource module. Uh, what this will basically do is that it will uh, tell Neutron or the extension framework that what the new, new resource looks like. Uh, you will need a, a database schema uh, because now you want to store these attributes. So you want to make them persistent. Um, and you will need migration scripts because uh, Neutron releases every six months, with, so uh, so you need to make sure that your tables are preloaded uh, once you install Neutron. Uh, once you have these uh, database uh, ready, you need to access these uh, resources. So you'll add a DB API layer, layer uh, and then and then then you'll add uh, or enhance the existing uh, Python Neutron client CLIs and uh, your orchestration tools to consume these REST APIs which are exposed by Neutron. Based on the two uh, different uh, types of uh, um, extensions, uh, they could reside in either the core, uh, core location, or if it's a vendor-specific location, it will reside in the vendor repo. I'll talk a little bit more about the vendor repo later and talk about the core and vendor decomposition. But uh, let's... Uh, dive deep into each of those steps. So what do you mean by resource module and why do we do this? Uh, the resource module is basically, as I said, was um, it tells Neutron and the extension framework what the resource looks like. So, um, uh, so when Neutron start, when the plugin is initialized and uh, Neutron service is started, it will look at all the uh, extensions that are, ex uh, that are existing in the extensions path and it will try to load them. So that is why the name of the extension and the class name should be uh, same. Uh, that's a requirement. Um, and uh, also that um, you will need to implement uh, some of the basic method, the contract binding between the extension mechanism uh, and telling, which will describe uh, your extension in detail. For example, you'll have a method like get uh, resources or uh, get description, which will describe uh, what this uh, resource is all about, um, and uh, it's it's it you know once once you are done with that, uh, the extension manager takes care of you know loading it in Neutron, and it will provide you with your URI, a uh, REST API, so that uh, you can access these resources. Um, also, um, uh, once you define these uh, resources, uh, uh, your it's as I said mentioned before, you don't. Not every plugin implements every other extensions. So you can decide what your plugin can, needs to extend. So that, that can be done by just adding the name of the extension in the supported extension aliases. Uh, and another thing is, as a side note, is that uh, if you have any helper modules uh, which reside in the extensions directory uh, and you don't want them to be loaded as extensions, uh, you will start them with an underscore. So that, that way Neutron knows that these are just helper modules. So this is how a resource attribute map looks like. And that's the fine difference between the resource, ad, uh, resource extension and attribute extension. So uh, in this example, uh, let's say you're extending a resource. 
with the resource name. Uh, this guy is doing adding a new uh, resource with ID and name. While uh, on the other hand, if you want to extend an attribute, uh, you will take the existing core uh, object and you're going to add the ex name of the extension or the name of the attribute. And then you can define the type, you know, whether it's a string or a Boolean. Uh, so that's the uh, example attribute map. Um, the next thing was uh, once you have uh, the resource module ready, uh, you need to per persist them. So you will create tables uh, and model classes uh, which would uh, store these attributes. And then, as I mentioned, the da database migration scripts needs to be uh, written so that up for upgrade or whenever you install Neutron, uh, all the tables are preloaded. And this is where the migration scripts will uh, uh, reside. Also, uh, you need to then perf uh, write a database API uh, to access access these uh, uh, these resources which are stored uh, and to perform CRUD operations. So, uh, let's say you have written an extension called Security Groups. Uh, so, in that case, if you want to retrieve a list of all the security groups from from the database, you will implement the get security groups uh, ex uh, method. Uh, I mean, if you write a method called list security groups, it won't work because the extension framework expects it to be in a certain uh, naming convention, expects a certain naming convention to be followed. So, uh, so the get uh, extension name will retrieve uh, a particular uh, extension if you pass in the UUID, or it will uh, retrieve all a list of uh, the, ex uh, the resources. The create extension name would create, uh, the update would update, and the delete would be responsible to delete uh, that extension. So these are the minimum set of uh, DB APIs that you need to uh, at least write. And the last step was to uh, once once everything is ready, so Neutron will automatically load all these extensions, and uh, it will form a URI for your new, new extension. And uh, you can then access this uh, URI via REST APIs. Uh, you could write your own scripts, or you can enhance Horizon, or you could add CLIs into Python Neutron client. So if you look at the workflow, uh, the, uh, the user will perform an API request for your extension, uh, it would uh, pre pretty much do the keystone authentication there, and then you know if, whether the extension is loaded or not. If it's not loaded, it's going to return a uh, not found error code. Uh, if it is um, if it is present, then it will you know either let the extension process it, or if it's an attribute extension, it will let the uh, core core to process it, and then a response will be generated. So as I previously mentioned that um, uh, there was a core, vendor core decomposition that happened in Neutron. Uh, so in, as part of Kilo release, uh, we removed all the implementation and the code of vendor uh, specific code uh, out of Neutron tree and moved it into, uh, into uh, you know, stack for repositories uh, so that they're maintained by the vendors themselves. So how does this affect the extension framework? The extension framework is largely unaffected because um, it, it mostly, most of the code resides in the Neutron code today. Uh, the only thing that uh, changes is that today, if you want to write your own vendor-specific uh, uh, extensions, uh, they will reside in your vendor repo. So you maintain it. You, uh, uh, you write unit tests for it. Uh, and uh, you will uh, be responsible for that code. Um, so having said that, uh, laid the groundwork for you know, what are the use, different use cases. Uh, we at Cisco um, uh, encountered a few use cases and problems. Uh, so, and how, how we solve that, uh, I'll invite Dilip to talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Abhishek. So uh, we went over the extension framework, the details. Now what I will do is I'll go into some of the cases, the examples uh, where we need to address a problem and how we leverage this extension framework to address those issues in OpenStack environment. 
just a quick recap. At a high level, there are two types of extensions. One is a vendor specific extension. It's predominantly plugin specific and the implementation is in the plugin most of the work. The other one is uh, it is the additional functionality that you would add to the existing neutron capabilities. Some of the examples like we already went over that security groups or DVR functionality or provider network kind of thing. But that is mostly plugin independent. It's mostly like done in the common code and each individual plugin has to enable it if they want to realize it. But this example cases that we are going to cover today is predominantly going to be that vendor specific feature part. Though the implementation is somewhat very similar, the difference is where that code realize, uh, resides and how we realize that functionality. Except that most of them will be identical. Uh, as uh, Abhishek mentioned, there, are, uh, there is a discussion around whether this extension framework is the right way to handle the additional functionality. The reason being like the common core, there are three resources, there are like 25 plus additional resources that's been added. The experiment, the expectation was those features will be added initially as an experimentation. Once it becomes more mature and they expect it to become part of the core, that is uh, right now it is not happening as fast as community expected. So there is a discussion about how to make it more standardized. But having said that, the extension framework for vendor specific features will be largely unaffected and it will be the same model that we will be following. With the, ha having said that, let me explain like why are we looking at this functionality, right? The extensions. Before I go into that, let me explain like the current uh, switch that we have and what this switch does. Uh, I, this is a Nexus 1000V switch from Cisco. It is a multi-hypervisor distributed virtual switch supported on KV, uh, prior to KVM, ESX, Hyper-V platforms. And also it integrates with various orchestration tools. The key thing is this has a rich set of functionality because it leverages the same Nexus OS code base that is available across data center platforms from Cisco. Since all these features are available, the expectation is we provide the consistency across all these hypervisor environments. Uh, some of the customers has uh, dual environments. They will be using OpenStack, and along with that, they might have already has uh, their existing uh, high, uh, virtual environments. And they have a specific operational model, and the ask was, how do I achieve the same operational model in the OpenStack mo environment so that from the network perspective, it is transparent whether you are using OpenStack or you are using something else like uh, Virtual Center or your own custom orchestration portal. That was one key requirement. The other key requirement is in a traditional OpenStack model, largely when you deploy the VM, that is the time where you define the policies, associate the policies. What it means is users are the ones who are controlling the policies. Uh, in, in a, if you look at a typical data center environment, that, not, that may not be the case all the time. Sometimes admins do want to have the control where they can define the policies. At the same time, users can deploy the VMs at will and leverage these policies or attach these policies. How do we satisfy these requirements? That was the major issue that we looked at when we started integrating with the OpenStack. Now let, go, let me go over a little bit into the details of what does admin defined policies means. Uh, typically, like as I mentioned earlier, you, you, the users could be defining the policies, but there are certain policies. For example, co compliance. It is best left to the administrators because admins know what exactly compliance means. It may be that if you have a HR uh, web server, you may want to monitor all the traffic from that. If you have those kind of requirements, also how do I prevent DOS protection? How do I pre protect from the spoofing attacks? All those functionalities is best like the admins are the ones who knows what to do. But at the same time, every time when a user launches a VM, you, want to, you don't want to be coming on the way. You need a way to define these policies and users can consume it. So this is exactly where the concept of port profiles came in. 
uh, if you are using Nexus switches, uh, it's already there in the Nexus switches. So the idea here is you group the policies, like in this example, if you are using a web server profile, you define a profile for that. That defines all the policies needed for the web server. And the same way for application servers, or you can define these policies, like you can even define by group, whatever way you want, HR web servers, this is the policy. Now once these policies are defined, as a user, when I'm launching the VM, I know that what this uh, VM is. This VM is meant for uh, HR web service. So I will associate the appropriate profile for that. And uh, once you associate that, without worrying about what are all the policies underneath it, those policies will be implemented by the network infrastructure. This is at a high level what admin defined policies is. In a nutshell, it is nothing but the port profile slash network templates. How do we get such a functionality into the infrastructure, right? Uh, OpenStack doesn't have such a concept yet. So what we did was we implemented an extension to the port called Policy Profile Extension. If, there is a, so, I mean, we could have called it Port Profile Extension, but we decided to use a different name to avoid the confusion. The Port Profile itself is nothing but the entire capsule of the policies. Whereas the policy profile is the name of that port profile. The model that we used is just like administrators would come and define the policies using whatever orchestration tools or preferred tools they use, they can go ahead and define the policies. Once the policies are defined using this policy profile extension, we were able to expose that port profiles into the OpenStack environment. Now, the OpenStack environment has the list of all the port profiles that are available as policy profiles. In this example, like I mentioned earlier, we have four port, different port, pro, port profiles exposed as policy profiles. Now, when the user wants to launch the VM as part of the port create, now he can specify what profile he needs to apply. He doesn't need to worry about whether that, what are all the policies underneath it. That is left to the administrator. That separation, when uh, the, this was one of the key differentiation, like a lot of customers who are looking at uniformity across multiple environments, OpenStack, non-OpenStack environments, they were looking at this functionality, and using the extension, we were able to achieve that. This is a, now let's go into little bit details into this extension. How did we realize this extension? Like Abhishek mentioned, there are two types of extensions. One is the resource extension, the other one is the attribute extension. The policy profile concept itself is new to the OpenStack. Since it is new to the OpenStack, we need to define it as a resource. So we defined first this was a resource. And that, as earlier we went over that, like what are all the steps? We need to have DB schemas, we need to have extension policies, migration scripts, all the stuff, these are the places where it is defined. Once that resource is defined, how do we use this resource? That resource is available, somewhere you have to use that resource. That is where we did the attribute extension. As part of the port create, you would be attaching this policy profile. So we did the extension, attribute extension to the port create, and there we specified the policy profile. Uh, this is uh, where that key construct comes in as part of the attribute maps. Uh, the policy profile has two, obje uh, two objects here. One is a name and the other one is the ID. The ID is the unique identifier of that, that resource. You define the resource using this object. Now the second one is as part of the Neutron port extension, there uh, in the attributes it's shown. Uh, as we define that, there is a new extension called N1KV profile. With that name, you are able to now see that extension. There will be REST APIs, everything automatically generated. Uh, even the Neutron CLI, we extended that where you can specify that. That is what we showed earlier here. Let me go back and show that. At the bottom of the list, you can see that that uh, hyphen hyphen n1 kv colon profile be, with that uh, additional changes that we made, we were able to expose this. This is the one extension we did. And 
once we did this extension, in fact, like we were able to use this for many other purposes. Because we made it so generic, now additional capabilities that we are looking at are the features that is being available and customers want to use it. We were able to use this port profile extension. I will go into one of the such example. This is a one classic example that people look at it. Today, when you have provider networks and the VMs shows up in the provider networks, they can communicate with each other because they're all on the same segment. You can use certain capabilities like security groups, but they are very error prone or you have to build some orchestration systems on top of it. Especially if you are looking at non-IP traffic, it becomes even difficult. So how do you achieve isolation? One simple answer is, well, we can create multiple segments. Yes, you can create multiple segments. Now you cannot use the same subnet. Well, you can use the NAT. That's another option. Yes, we can use the NAT, but that becomes too complex. Now you are adding more complexity. One simple answer is uh, things like private VLANs can be used. These are certain things that people are already deployed and using it in other environments. The question that came up is, how do we use private VLANs in the OpenStack environment? Uh, OpenStack by itself doesn't have private VLAN feature, but the virtual switch, that underlying virtual switch has that capability. How do we leverage that? So we did a very simple thing. As part of the port profile, you have that command saying like private VLAN isolated. Once you have that capability, now we know that that port is a isolated port, and it can only communicate to the external world or any other resources like if you have your uh, shared VMs uh, meant for common services, that could be accessed, so we can use that. There is also a slightly a different variation of this isolation where group of VMs, they can communicate with each other, but not with other VMs. We were able to use the same port profile extension capability or policy profile to achieve that. The key next summary I want to highlight is the extensions that OpenStack provided, it helped a lot to realize the functionality that the customers are looking at using these uh, capabilities. This one is a port extension. Now let's look at the other, ex other extension that we made. This is on the network. So one of the issues with today's OpenStack model, at least, uh, which has some certain constraints for certain deployments is it treats all the networks are identical. Take a VLAN network. But the reality is, what if I want to enable multicast on that VLAN network? Sure, you can go ahead and enable uh, IGMP everywhere. But because your infrastructure may not be supporting that scale, you may have 1,000 VLANs. But the infrastructure, the physical hardware that is available may not be able to support IGMP and all 1,000 VLANs. Now, how, what do I do? How do I enable IGMP for select set of VLANs? That is a capability that it is not possible today with existing OpenStack. There are ways like you can do a provider networks, but the issue is for every VLAN, you have to manually go and enable provider networks. You want to have the same dynamism where dynamically users on demand basis can allocate and deallocate their resources. If you have to achieve that, uh, the existing ha net networking has a constraint, and this became a real challenge in certain deployments. The same thing goes for VXLAN. I think in the other session, uh, previous session, we were talking about VXLAN multicast mode. I wouldn't go into the details. There are different flavors. VXLAN itself is evolving. Multicast is the original way of uh, implementing the VXLAN when you have a multi-destination traffic like broadcast. You use a multicast group to send it. Again, you have flavors like you can allocate a multicast group, one per VXLAN segment, or you can use a common shared one, or there is a new mode which is completely multicast independent called unicast mode. The underlying switch has the capability of supporting all of these models simultaneously. They can coexist. That's the key. Because it really depends on the workload requirements, right? If you have a production workload that has a lot of uh, multi-destination traffic or broadcast traffic, you may want to use the multicast mode. But you cannot en enable multicast on all the, on all the uh, VXLAN segments because the groups are so limited. 
how do I, what am I going to do? I should be able to selectively use the segments with multicast for certain workloads, and for the rest of the workloads, use the other methods. How do I provide such a capability? One simple answer that could be is take VXLAN type driver, implement another type driver, say VXLAN uh, multicast shared mode type driver. That could be one way to go it. But if you take that approach, that means you are, if you look at the, at the end, it is multi you know, VXLAN. It is not something different than VXLAN. It is a flavor of the VXLAN. For every flavor, if you start defining a type, that defeats the purpose of having a shared infra type drivers. So how do we achieve this, right? So this is where, again, the extension mechanism became handy. What we did was we did an extension to the network uh, object. And with that extension, we were able to achieve the things like, now you can define the profiles, the similar way that you, we, were, we talked about policy profiles. Now you can define the profiles for the network, which is the network properties. That is a property of the entire network. You can specify now, OK, here is a gold profile with multicast mode, silver profile with multicast shared mode, or you can have a branch profile. With, once you have that, one, and as part of the network create, now you can go ahead and specify what kind of network you want. So the user may be able to say that, okay, I know my workload requires a silver level treatment, so I'm going to use a silver level profile. Uh, or based on the tenants, if the, the administrator itself can specify that, if the tenant is a tier one tenant, he only have access to the gold pro profiles. All those options now is possible. We were able to achieve that using this uh, extension mechanism. That's net net the two extensions that we want to cover today. One is for the port, to extend the port properties. How did we do that? And we were able to get all the features with just one extension. We didn't try to extend it by having one separate extension per feature. That is one, uh, one thing that we achieved. The other one is the network profile extension to do the network, attach the properties to the network. So in summary, the key takeaway, if you look at the extension mechanism that Neutron provides, it's pretty flexible. Uh, it's not that uh, difficult to add extensions, but it doesn't mean that we want to add extensions all the time. You have to be at most careful because when you add extensions, that means you will have different implementations on different platforms. That is one thing you want to avoid uh, from when, you, when you look at the OpenStack main, uh, their main, uh, the, you want to, if you want to look at the main objective, one of the things is have as much commonality as possible. So that is something that we want to, uh, one needs to consider before adding an extension. This is uh, another factor. What we did was to keep that goal, we always keep these features as optional. By default, they are disabled. That means the common functionality is uh, only what is available everywhere. Only on need basis, if the customer really is looking for such a functionality, then they can enable it. The, uh, the, that's how you can have a balancing between what extensions can do without having too much divergence in this ecosystem. Uh, that's what we have today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. All right. I'll take that up. Uh, so a uh, plugin is uh, something that would uh, realize the API call. So let's say for in our case, uh, the Nexus 1000 V is a virtual switch. Uh, and uh, we want our virtual switch to be inter uh, integrated with OpenStack Neutron. So all the uh, Neutron APIs, uh, the requests that we make, we want to make sure that the same configuration is passed down to the Nexus 1000 V switch. So the plugin will do that. The plugin will uh, take these calls and pass it down to your virtual switch or your physical switch. Uh, the extensions, on the other hand, is just a um, um, something that would 
uh, extend the current functionality of Neutron, and the plugin will realize that as well. So, I think the, uh, let me explain, right? Uh, in summary, yeah, if you have, the re what you have the functionality, how to implement it, because your infrastructure may have different ways of realizing it. That's what plugin does. Whereas extensions is extending the functionality itself, uh, whether that functionality is additional attributes or additional resources. Once you extend the functionality, there should be the plugin should be capable of supporting it. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that after you've implemented your extension here, then you need to uh, update the Neutron CLI and add support into Horizon and everything. So, uh, is there any automation of that for at least for the CLI? Obviously, not Horizon, but. Uh, if you add an extension, does it automatically show up in the Neutron CLI, or do you have to go in and modify the CLI code? Or you'll have to go and modify the CLI code. Okay, because it seems like with the, the data model that you're expressing there, that there should be able to be some automation of that kind of thing. It seems like if everybody's having to hack on the, the Neutron AP, um, CLI, that's a bit of a source of a problem there. Yeah, so uh, the vendor-specific uh, CLIs generally are... are um, um, the vendor will maintain them outside the tree. It won't be a part of the core CLIs that come with OpenStack Neutron. So you will be modifying those CLIs as long as they're vendor specific. But if you're bringing, up, bringing a common core extension, in that case, uh, uh, the CLI will be as part of the core uh, CLI. Uh, so if you add an attribute, to the core, yeah. a core attribute, then yeah. that will automatically oh, show up. Oh, for attribute extensions, you uh, uh, you don't have to worry about the CLIs because the CLI, what will it will do is it will just pack these attributes and send that request over to the Neutron server. So the Neutron will know, uh, based on what extensions are loaded, it will look at the attribute map and see whether it's, it's a valid attribute okay. or not, okay. and it will be sense. validated against that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Quick question, and maybe you covered it, so excuse me if you did already, but I think in the beginning you mentioned there's two types of extensions, the vendor-specific and, and the general Com ones, right? Yeah. What are these two use cases that you cover today? Are they just Cisco or? or uh, this, is this is vendor-specific. This is vendor okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, thanks, everybody.